opportunities in the space and what value can we add to our services. So one of the main use cases for IOTA, which is how the semiconductors get involved, is fog computation and fog storage. So are you familiar with the difference between cloud and fog? No idea, no. Okay, so, so this is very, very simple to understand. So, you know, of course, you, you know of the cloud. These are these huge data centers that are spread across the world, which contains all of our data that we have in the cloud. Everyone knows about the cloud. But as we are doing Internet of Things, as we're moving more towards this ubiquitous computation, storage, and so on and so forth, it moves further and further away from these central large data stations and more towards the edge of the network. And of course, covering the edge of the network is a lot harder than controlling just a very dense centralized area. And so this is what is considered a fog. And and this is just because of weather terminology it just continues. So I think Cisco was the ones that popularized this first. So that's the fog. The fog is essentially the cloud in a distributed fashion. So you have smaller but more of them and geographically dispersed computational station. So that's fog computing and fog storage. And this is a very, very big deal because if you have tens of thousands or millions of sensors relaying data, you cannot send it directly to the cloud simply because, again, laws of physics comes in and ruin the day and you have signal collisioning and you have interference. And I think everyone has experienced at least a few times that their neighbor are fucking up their Wi-Fi connection or when they connect Bluetooth, it interferes with their Wi-Fi and suddenly their internet isn't working properly. I'm quite sure everyone has experienced this. And you can imagine that times a million, if you have a million sensors all trying to send data at the same time to the cloud. So instead, you have to find a way to spread this out, distribute this load of data. And that's where the fog comes in. So you have more computational stations placed strategically close to areas with sensors. And so the data gets analyzed locally, and then it later gets relayed to the cloud after it has been condensed because it has already been analyzed. So here you have the issue of how do you incentivize the fog computational stations to care about these sensors? Because let's say you have a million sensors. These may be owned by a thousand different entities, like a thousand different stakeholders. And how are you going to, in a seamless fashion, as a fog computational station provider like Cisco, how are you going to make money of that? The problem today is that you can't use the old subscription service because that would be way too expensive. Every time a new sensor pops up, you would have to <laughs> sign an agreement and do all kinds of this laborious bullshit. That doesn't work. And that's where IOTA comes in. That's where the machine-to-machine -machine payment system comes in. So if the sensors themselves can simply pay the computational station, then you get rid of all the red tape, you get rid of all this expensive, inefficient stuff, and they can just pay directly. And here, of course, the semiconductors have no choice. They have to be able to offer a chip to the sensors and the computational stations that can actually accommodate this technology. And this is where we get reached out to by those players because they realize that they have to provide this. There is simply no way of getting around it. And the same thing goes for storage, because as you, you alluded to earlier, these devices have very scarce abilities. They don't have a lot of storage, so they have to purchase storage if they, they are continuously gathering data, or bandwidth for that matter. So you have this necessity where this machine economy is completely inevitable. And in order for that to work, you have to make hardware that actually accommodates the software. And currently, the only software on the world that accommodates this is IOTA. And that's why we are being reached out to, rather than us like trying to pitch this crazy idea to them. They are completely aware of this already. I've got another question about ASIC upgradability, right? So say you've developed your nice little proof of work algorithm, and for some unforeseen reason, you want to change it. How do you make sure that old devices are going to be compatible? Yeah, very good question. So this goes back to the, the big problem that is always around new technology. Like, how do we standardize this? How do we come to a consensus as humans on the technology? Because we tend to suck at it. So what we have to do and then what we are working on right now is standardizing this protocol. So we are working with the standardization bodies on standardizing this because 
unless there is standardization, the problem you just mentioned occurs inevitably. It's just how technology has always been. So as soon as this has been standardized, as soon as the consensus among the humans has been on this is the hashing function, this is what we're going with, then it doesn't matter if someone comes up with a better integrated circuit that is slightly more efficient because the underlying hashing function is the same. So all devices will still be able to carry out their transactions. That's the first part of it. The other thing is, what about all of the devices that already exists out there that do not have this hasher device? I like this component. Like, what about those devices? And they have to rely on IOTA as it is right now. They are limited. There is no way around that. It's just like kind of trying to play a very graphic intensive game of 2017 on your PlayStation from 1995. Tough luck. It just doesn't work. <laughs> it's, it's a new realm. It's a new paradigm. And that's why it's so important to standardize this right now before the Internet of Things truly explodes into billions and billions and billions of devices. So one thing we haven't discussed here is data integrity. Yeah. So data integrity is one of the unique selling points of the distributed ledger in the beginning. This idea of having immutable data that no one can tamper with is the ultimate goal sort of for an age where we depend on big data and we rely on data for pretty much all of our decisions indirectly. So the blockchain simply cannot scale as we've gone over to accommodate billions and billions and billions of data packets being sent. Like you can't put all of those data packets on the blockchain because the blockchain can't even handle their own simple transactions. And the other problem with the blockchain is that it would be too expensive. Like try to imagine paying 50 cents or 60 cents just to have one data packet and short integrity. It just doesn't work. So the way that people up to now have been doing it is that they're doing it in intervals. So they're saving up a lot of data and then they're hashing that data and making a Merkle root of that data and then they put it onto the blockchain. And this in theory, sure, it works for a proof of concept, but it doesn't work in large scale deployments. And it also has this problem of not being real time. It's not fine granular. You can't ensure individual data packets. But because IOTA doesn't have the scaling and fee problems that the blockchain has, you can actually use it as a genuine data anchoring protocol. And this is immensely important because this means that all data from all kinds of sensors all kinds of devices, machinery, manufacturing, and so on and so forth, supply chain, you can guarantee that this data cannot be changed ever again as soon as it has been attached to the Tangle ledger. And this means you can start to build applications on top of that. You can start to optimize insurance. And I mean, that's a huge deal by itself. You, you can start to optimize analytics, artificial intelligence, because artificial intelligence is also a very interesting topic where As you probably know, the way that Tesla uses artificial intelligence is that they use over-the-air updates. So if one car is learning something, then it updates the rest of the car. So the entire fleet kind of has this new knowledge. But that means you have to trust those new learning sets that you receive in your car. But imagine a man in the middle attack, some crazy lunatic, that decides, hey, fuck this, I want to ruin someone's life. So I insert a false learning set and then this car receives it and instead of artificial intelligence you suddenly have artificial insanity but with data integrity you can know for a fact no this data packet doesn't match the one that i am supposed to receive so i don't accept it and so you can start to build a new cybersecurity model which will be insanely important in a world where the internet of things is kind of running everything from cars to infrastructure to e-health yeah you get the idea we we tend to think of the data integrity component of iota as at least as important as the transactional settlements most of the proof of concept we have been doing together with companies like energy is around that and it's just a very important topic 
Hey, David, this has been absolutely fantastic. And, you know, you've been a real sport. It was it was a little bit adversarial at times, maybe a little bit more than it needed to be, but no, only no, because no, I really no, like your work. No, very, very, very good. I really appreciate uh, the discussion. And I, I really welcome those kinds of tough questions and because we, we have nothing to hide. Like, this is a completely non-profit, open source, grassroots movement, and we we want to just make the best technology possible. So all sorts of input is always good. Fantastic. Hey, thanks a bunch. Nice call, man.